there's no prospect for any of us of avoiding death at some time in the future. We really do not need the Bible to remind us that it is appointed to man to die once, Hebrews 9.27. But we certainly have to be reminded often of what the next part of that verse says. After that, after death that is, comes the judgment. And how long after death is that? Well, the answer can be found easily in the teaching of Jesus. Listen to his authoritative announcement about future judgment. In Matthew 13, verses 40 to 42, Jesus opened up the future for us. Here are his words. Just as the tares are gathered up and burnt with fire, so it shall be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will dispatch his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit iniquity. And he will cast them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. At the same time, the righteous, Jesus went on to say, that is to say, those whom God finds acceptable will shine brilliantly in their Father's kingdom. Matthew 13, verse 43. What a dramatic description Jesus gives here of the destiny of man. On the one hand, brilliance and glory for those who serve God, and on the other hand, the appalling fate of being burned up like so much rubbish. Jesus likened the fate of the wicked, you will notice, to the burning of tares. Many passages in the Old Testament speak of a consuming fire which will destroy the wicked root and branch. Mercifully, Scripture nowhere says that all the wicked will be tortured forever and ever in a never-ending hellfire. This may come as a surprise to some. It's a little-known fact that noted scholars from all of the different Christian groups have protested against the popular idea that hellfire will involve conscious torture of human beings forever. I believe that many are put off the Christian faith precisely because they find it impossible to believe that a God who commands us to love our enemies would actually inflict on his enemies a permanent conscious torment for billions upon billions of years. The mind cannot even begin to grasp such a thing, even if it were taught in the scriptures. We'll be examining that subject in great, greater detail, but for the moment, let us look at God's projected scheme for the future judgment. It's only common sense that we be informed about what God intends to do, and he has revealed this in the Bible. We need first, however, briefly to review some of our findings so far. We have been attempting to show that death for all of us is like an unconscious sleep. That sleep will be interrupted at the resurrection. And for Christians, that resurrection will happen when Jesus returns, and not before. The Bible warns us not to adopt the idea that any of the dead, except, of course, Jesus, have already been resurrected. You will find that strong warning in 2 Timothy 2, verse 18. It's amazing that more attention has not been paid to Paul's clear statement here. Just recently I was reading in a prominent Christian magazine that a distinguished Bible professor expressed the belief that at the moment of our death, Christians are resurrected and given a new body. That really is a flat contradiction of Scripture. The Bible always says that we receive a body fit for immortality only at the future resurrection of all the Christians. That will happen when Jesus returns. 1 Corinthians 15.23 says it plainly. Those who belong to Christ will be woken up from the sleep of death at Jesus' coming. What then is to be the fate of the wicked? The first thing to be said on that score is that the wicked dead are not at present suffering any kind of punishment. Listeners will be interested to hear an authoritative word from Martin Luther, the great reformer, on this subject. In a sermon Luther gave in 1522, he said explicitly, and I quote, the rich man, in the story of Lazarus and the rich man, was not really in hell because the proper hell will come into being only at the future judgment day. End of quotation from Martin Luther. Luther also said this about hell as a place of punishment. And I quote, that there should be a specific place in which the damned souls are now, as the artists paint it, that I count for nothing. Not even the demons are yet in hell. End of quotation from Luther, the Protestant reformer. This opinion of Luther agrees exactly with the teaching of Jesus, who spoke of the fire of hell existing only after he returns in the future. Let me give you again the flavor of Jesus' teaching on this important question. 
But first the words of John the Baptist, who certainly would have taught the same as Jesus. John the Baptist talked about the wrath to come in Matthew 3, verse 7. Now, by the wrath to come, John certainly does not mean wrath to be experienced by an individual at the moment of his death. No, the wrath to come is exactly what it says, the wrath to come at a future time in human history. And that time, thankfully, has not yet arrived, but it will. It's to be the time when, as John the Baptist went on to say, when trees which do not bring forth good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire, Matthew 3, verse 10. It's to be at that same future time that Jesus will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire, Matthew 3, verse 12. On another occasion, Jesus said to his audience these awesome words, There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves being cast out. And they will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Luke 13, verses 28 and 29. Jesus was describing there the great event of the future, his second coming. It will be then, and not until then, that the wicked will experience the punishment of hellfire. The issuing of rewards and punishments is always associated in the Bible with the future coming of Jesus. Listen to another of his great sayings on this same subject. I quote, For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels. He will then reward every man according to what he's done. Matthew 16, verse 27. Surely it's plain from these statements of Jesus that rewards and punishments belong to the future when Jesus returns from heaven. Nothing is said by Jesus about rewards and punishments the moment an individual dies. The original scheme and Jesus' ideas seem to be on a collision course here. On yet another occasion, Jesus said of a man who had shown a generous hospitality, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous, Luke 14, 14. Now that's a straightforward enough statement. Jesus said the same thing when he spoke of those who are reckoned worthy to attain to the future age and the resurrection of the dead, Luke 20, verse 35. I want you to see from these clear verses that the gateway to endless life, or indeed to judgment of any sort, is always via resurrection in the Bible. There's no hope of a surviving death as an immortal disembodied soul. There's no immediate rewarding of the good or the bad at death. All rewards and all the blessings of endless life with Jesus will be given only at the future resurrection. Now with that scheme in mind, the Bible can be read with clarity. It is simply confusing to speak of the dead having been rewarded already with endless life or endless punishment. It is most unhelpful to intelligent Bible study to teach that the dead have already gained bliss as disembodied souls or that the wicked are already being tortured in hell. There is no life after death apart from the future resurrection. That's why we've been emphasizing over and over again that the word to raise someone from the dead actually means to wake someone up from the sleep of death. And that is the great goal of the Christian, as he longs for the return of his master and the return to life at that time of all his Christian brothers. The biblical program is simplicity itself, and delightfully free of all the complexities which our traditions have added to it. We have cluttered the teaching of Jesus with all sorts of complex ideas about what the dead are doing. In fact, the dead are doing nothing at all, according to the Bible. We saw that in previous programs, and cited numbers of biblical verses in support. The dead are really just dead. They're out of it until God, using his son Jesus, wakes them up from the sleep of death. This is the uniform and consistent teaching of the Bible. Let me finish by encouraging you to consider that what we've been proposing in this program is no different from the views of a mass of 17th century Baptists. In a statement of faith presented to Charles II of England in 1660, they documented their understanding of the Bible. They called themselves General Baptists, and they believed, and I quote, that the soul between death and the resurrection at the last day has neither pleasure nor pain, but is in a state of insensibility. Their belief was that, and I quote again, there shall be a resurrection from the graves of the earth, an eternal judgment at the appearing of Christ and his kingdom. 2 Timothy 4, verse 1, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. At which time of judgment 
which is unalterable and irrevocable, every man shall receive according to things done in his body. End of quotation from that statement made by Baptists to Charles II of England in 1660. These Baptists were following the scriptures accurately. They did not think of eternal torments or endless bliss as something to be experienced at the moment of death, but rather at the return of Christ. Without resurrection, in other words, there is no conscious existence for the dead. That's a central and fundamental biblical fact. Often, however, it seems to get buried in theological tradition, and we can't help thinking that the shadow of Plato hangs over much of what we today call Christian belief. If souls cannot die, then there really is no such thing as death for any of us. But that was the devil's great lie when he told our first parents, you will not surely die. The Christian life is a life of truth-seeking. We cannot afford to be in the dark on the great issues of life and death. The Berean spirit of humble searching for the wisdom of the Bible was commended in Acts chapter 17. They searched the scriptures daily, as all committed Christians will want to do, to see if what they were being told was true.